Thank you guys for, for coming back for the second part. This is the part that scares me the most. Yeah. Mm. So uh, just out of curiosity, where is everyone from? You're in? Nashville. OK. Charlotte. Charlotte. Greensboro. Greensboro. I live in Nashville, but I was born and raised in Goldsboro. OK. OK, so you're almost an Eastern. Okay, but you live in the western part. I rest my head in the western. Gotcha. Where are you from? Okay. Winston Salem. Winston Salem. Western parts of the state all over. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Okay. And you two are from Wilmington. Yes. <laughs> and, and now the, it, we've talked a lot about you know this colonial masonry, and we talked a lot about that schism. Does anyone have any questions before we begin about the schisms or anything? Along those lines. Um, so you're talking about in, the ancients being in the eastern part of the state. Right. And the Scottish Lodge guys down at uh, Fayetteville, where, where you talk Cross Creek. Right? Yeah, Cross Creek. Were, were, there, any, were there any moderns uh, in the eastern part? That's a very good question. And the short answer, depending on what happened with Solomon Lodge, we don't know. Uh, Solomon Lodge disappears. The Grand Lodge itself says that Solomon Lodge um, seems to go out of existence around 1754. Now, with no documentation, I would love to know why they say that. I would love to know if Solomon Lodge split in half, or maybe even two-thirds and a third, because that's what happens. St. John's has a long history of having break-off lodges. Um, in fact, one called 319 in Wilmington, it's the Wilmington Lodge, they left St. John's Lodge um, because um, they thought that St. John's were a bunch of lushes and drunkards. St. John's 3. Uh, St. John's 1. Yeah, so 319 in Wilmington actually left us for that reason, and it, they, they wanted to have a more of a teetotal lodge. I guess St. John's number one was, was really tearing it up. Um, but we don't know where, if there were moderns anywhere. We don't have enough records to really be able to tell. And that's really disappointing, because if Solomon Lodge was working even up into the 1760s, it would be very interesting to know. Now, uh, I'll bring this over. To, we're going to jump back a little bit into the colonial period. Um, when Benjamin Franklin goes to France, his lodge in Philadelphia was a modern's lodge. And he goes, as you know, he was a diplomat to France under Washington, um, under the Continental Congress, I should say, um, before Washington was president. But he goes to France and comes back, and his modern's lodge had changed to ancients. And in fact, they considered him a clandestinely made mason. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin was considered a clandestinely made mason. He, in fact, on his death, was denied a Masonic burial because of it. Well, it seems that uh, from Solomon to St. John's 1, they did patch him over. Now, how the rest of the lodges became ancients, it could have been that Cornelius Harnett was handing out that type of dispensation and with it that type of education. One thing we do know, and this actually leads us into the West, uh, there's... I'm sorry. Um, oh, no. Caswell. Richard Caswell. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. My brain had gone completely blank for about a second there. I do apologize. Richard Caswell, we know at one point, is around Salisbury. Of course, he was a surveyor. Somewhere he gets involved in Freemasonry. We don't know where it happened. What we do know is when he went back to Newburn, they had to heal him in 1772. He had to do the degrees again because he became a Freemason and he was a rightful brother among us, but they were a clandestine lodge. So they actually had to heal Richard Caswell. It's an interesting twist. Now, in the 
in the west. And I'm going to be looking at the Yadkin PD River area, mostly Stanley County, Randolph County, that, that area. It's a very interesting area to begin with. While the east is getting inundated with men of money and means and a very high, powerful British families, the West is picking up Scot-Irish. And in case you didn't know, an Irishman, using the terminology of the time, so remember that I'm using the terminology of the time before I say this, an Irishman to an Englishman, as they said, was just a nigger turned inside out. That is how the English referred to the Irish. So the Scot-Irish and the Irish, they moved towards the West. Uh, the, the Germans from Pennsylvania, they also trickle down to the West. As they are moving into this area, this western part of the state, from Salisbury to Charlotte, at one point we think that there's possibly 800 people living in that area. In fact, there are some people that say, I have never seen a poorer people or poorer land than western North Carolina. That's a shocking thing to hear, especially if we travel back to the East and think about what the East was like. When Washington did his Southern tour, he went to visit Benjamin Smith, whose house stood where the Piggly Wiggly is in Leland. He goes and visits after visiting in Wilmington having a speech, he stayed at the, uh, about where the real cafe is for my Wilmingtonians. He stayed there. Then he went on and he stayed with his good friend, aide-de-camp, Benjamin Smith, which after having spent the night at the plantation called Belvedere, now makes Leland have the only piggly wiggly in the United States where we could honestly have a sign that says Washington slept here on our piggly wiggly meat department. <laughs> We don't have it, but we should. Uh, but when Washington traveled through, even he complained that these roads are absolutely horrible. They are nothing but mud and, and brambles and thickets. No good civilized person should have to live this way. And he was thankful to get out of North Carolina after traveling through it. There was a woman of quality, Janet Shaw, who arrived in North Carolina in about 1772. And she came in from Scotland by boat. Now, she is a Tory, absolutely a Tory, absolutely a conservative, the king and parliament above all else. There should be no reconciliation. You should come back and pay your taxes. And whatever parliament decides, that's for the good of all. And as she traveled through areas of North Carolina, she said that Cornelius Harnett was a large, gruff animal. She said that Robert Howe, the general, was an absolute womanizer. It makes you wonder what these people were really like. But then she also talks about being on the boat, going up the Black River, because the roads were impassable. And even from there, it was just long leaf pine trees as far as the eye could see, and some Negroes working on tar kilns. Now, I, do you guys have tar kilns out in this area? Do you find tar kilns in your yards ever? No? If you go to Burgaw in Wallace, it's a very common thing that if you're digging, you might hit some black earth, and it's not earth, it's, it's charcoal and you've dug into a tar kiln. Now a tar kiln is to make your naval stores. These are tar, pitch, and turpentine. And in the east, that is the staple. Tar, pitch, and turpentine. In fact, all that tar, pitch, and turpentine gets funneled into Wilmington, then shipped down to Brunswick Town before 1776, uh, because Brunswick Town is burned in 1776 after the Battle of Moore's Creek in retaliation for the Battle of Moore's Creek, in fact, um, 
Cornwallis orders the city burn, or the town burned. But that port exported 86% of all naval stores for the entire British Empire. Keep in mind that the British Empire extended all the way to India. Why would you burn it? I mean, I know it's bad about that, but if they were providing 86% of the naval stores, why would you burn it? He was that mad. <laughs> we, yeah, well, um, it never recovers. And the naval stores from North Carolina also take a massive hit. It's right at that moment when they burn Brunswick Town, when John Collette takes his torch and throws it into the church and burns down the church. And no, there were no people in it, so that part of the Patriot never happened. But he did burn down St. Philip's Church. That moment, the economy of North Carolina takes a huge hit. But the economy of North Carolina was based on rice along the coast because we were part of a triangle trade, the slave trade. And there's a reason it's called a triangle trade. It's, the slaves come from Africa and Europe into the Americas. From there, they might, the, the slaves that were working the plant, rice plantations, their rice will go on board the ships and drop down to the West Indies. And slaves there working in the, the cane fields, the sugar cane fields, will get the rice. That's what they're fed. Now, to give you an idea of what life was like for slaves, and this is very important for talking about how masonry kind of spreads to the West. Life for a slave. If you were a slave on board a ship, it is the most deplorable thing you could ever imagine. You are livestock. You have no room. You are either standing or lying down. And if you're lying down, people are piled on top of you. Hopefully, you're not on the bottom. And you take the trip from Africa into the Americas, or you're going to stop at the Americas and then drop down into the West Indies. If you find out that you're going to the Carolinas as a black man, you rejoice. You can have a family. You will be considered skilled labor because you're coming from Sri Lanka, or well, Sierra Leone, sorry, Sierra Leone. There they grow rice, if you know anything about Nigeria, Sierra Leone, that area of Africa, one of the native crops there is rice. So these Africans are brought to grow rice. They're considered skilled labor. They're also large, muscular people who are generally healthy. And that means that, okay, they can work in the rice paddy and then they can take care of a crop of longleaf pines. And if you've ever worked on a longleaf pine, has anyone ever worked on a longleaf pine? You have? have you, did you give it a cat face? Where you take the scraper turn and you're... Chainsaw and I cut it down. <laughs> Cheater. Okay. <laughs> Cheater. If, if, you're, if you cat face a longleaf pine, you are cutting these V's into the pine. And that is bringing the sap out and it goes down. And you box, it, cut a wedge at the bottom of the tree. And that's where you collect your, your, your sap. And from that, you can then boil it down, and you'll get tar, pitch, and turpentine. That was the hard work that these guys had. But if they were coming to the Carolinas, yes, that was the hard work they had. But a life expectancy of a slave in the Carolinas was at least another 20 to 25 years. If you found out you were going to the West Indies, your life expectancy from stepping off the boat to death was five years at most. You would be worked from sunup to sundown, fed nothing but rice, worked until you died to get the sugar cane. Because sugar is a great commodity to have. With it, you can make molasses. And if you make molasses, does anyone know what the byproduct of molasses always is? Rum. Yes. So if you are making molasses, you always have rum. If you make rum, you always end up with molasses. Now, these were the staples of the West Indies, this, the sugar cane, beet cane plantations. In Carolinas, it was large plantations of longleaf pines and possibly rice. Cotton was not Yet, until about 1798, cotton is not a viable crop. So 
our brethren, like Benjamin Smith, he was doing long leaf pines until the, the cotton engine, the cotton gin came out. That's what he was working on. Rice, pine. And these men were already men of wealth and money. They're making lots of money. But if you go to the West, these people are barely scraping by and the ground is not conducive to growing any type of crop except for those crops for subsistence. So the men that moved into the West, they were not always the men of means. They were usually poor. They were Irish. They were Scots. These are groups that are looked down on by the polite society of, say, Wilmington or New Bern. Oh, you're one of those. So these people are moving to the West. And with them come preachers. Of course, preachers. Because we have to help these men come to God. Well, if you're living a life that is based on subsistence, and you're not really making a whole lot of money. In fact, from, from in Stanley County, there are two inns. They're called ordinaries. And an inn provides a place to sleep. It provides food and alcohol. There are only two, from Salisbury to Charlotte, at one point. Gives you an idea of how little money there was. The people that built those inns were people like Richard Caswell, who had the money to do it. And he was just trying to help the people in the West. But the preachers are coming to help these same people find God. And with that preaching comes this idea of, you must be holy. You must live your life by these tenets. And anybody who goes to church often knows that if you change from one church to another, sometimes the message changes drastically, even within the same denomination. Well, the men in the West, already living a subsistence life, are already very independent. And when preachers started telling them what to do, they would find ways, as soon as the preacher would show up, to start preaching in the towns. They would find ways to disappear. And many preachers say, I started speaking, and they found ways to escape. <laughs> None of them wanted to be told how to live. But with these men of means from the East, of course, when they come and invest, many of them are Masons. Many of them are Masons. And they begin setting up small lodges. Now, a lot of these lodges, it's, it's a very interesting thing. They're not being chartered by anyone. Even Cornelius Harnett isn't reaching out and chartering them at first. We don't know how early some of these lodges actually start. But we do know that there are Masons and then other people being brought into Masonry by these Masons from these visiting masons. So there are lodges that are beginning to pop up. And we don't really know if they were really starting correctly or not. Like I said, Richard Caswell was in Salisbury. And he became a Freemason somewhere in the western part of the state. We're not sure where. When he traveled back, he had to be healed in 1772. Because though he's a rightful brother, it was a clandestine lodge. So he certainly was not an ancient. He certainly was not an ancient. He might have been in the West. We really don't know if they were, if they were moderns or ancients. When he came back over to the East, he becomes an ancient as he's healed. But he's certainly not an ancient, according to the rules, when he heads back to Kinston. Now... These areas, of, you've got to understand that travel is horrible. So the lodges are not going to be taking off and they're not going to be getting very large. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of support. 
In fact, if you were in the, the Petey River Valley, today, if you live around there, it's very easy to get to Charlotte. It's very easy to get to Salisbury. Not hard at all. Back then, it was a day trip. One day trip. In fact, there was the old Philadelphia Kings Highway that it was supposed to travel through, and it does cut through the state. And for them, they still couldn't reach it because the roads were so bad. Now, these lodges... Oh, my, my computer died. These lodges, as they are coming up, they are bringing some type of society to the people who have rejected church. And that's what they're looking at the, the lodges for. They're thinking of the lodges as a place to congregate, to possibly worship God with other people, but without somebody telling me how to do it. Very Gnostic. Has anyone ever studied Gnosticism? Have you? A little? Oh, okay. <laughs> Have you? A little? Okay. Gnosticism is a type of Christianity. You can find it very much in Egypt today. Um, there, that, that Coptic Christian is very much a Gnostic ideal. Uh, it's very much of a person coming to terms with God on his own terms, rather than being led to God by a priest or a preacher. Very egalitarian. These lodges that show up here are very much... Sorry, I'm trying to get that thing to work for me. Uh, they're very much these egalitarian lodges. One second. I do apologize. My computer hates me. <laughs> In fact, there's a tradition that during the American Revolution, we do know that there are lodges in the, in the West, and they say that they are very fervent and militant patriots. They're very fervent and militant patriots. That is very important to understand. If we think about these, these Freemasons in the West, in the East, as we had talked about them, these Freemasons were very much proud Britons, right? They, they were talking about reconciliation. Cornelius Harnett was one of very few who was saying, no, we're going independent. They didn't have much trouble finding help for the cause of independence in the West. And much of the reason for that is because of how these Freemasons already were thinking. After all, they're, they're creating lodges to get away from churches. Now, one, I've, I've got to find his name, sorry. One Freemason, in fact, is given a burial, and I was, I've got it written in here, so sorry. I can't find the actual quote, I do apologize, I must have erased it by mistake. <laughs> Funny how that should happen. But one Freemason is set up for a burial, and this James Ald, he's a, he's a priest, a preacher, he's a Methodist preacher, and he's out of Salisbury, and he's dropped down into Stanley County. And he's supposed to give this, this eulogy. Well, in his notes, he says, I gave a eulogy for J Mr. J.B., a horrible sinner and a Freemason. Obviously, people in the West we're using Freemasonry for something that these preachers that were following these people, they just didn't agree with. And it's very important to realize that James Ald found it necessary to mark that in his notes. I've buried Mr. J.B., a horrible sinner and a Freemason. I wonder what that eulogy sounded like. Here lies, you know. <laughs> here we have a striking instance. Okay, <laughs> it, it, you can only imagine what that must have sounded like. Now in the East, just to kind of show the dichotomy, 
many of the prominent men and many of the Episcopal priests were Freemasons. And notice, I said Episcopal. In the East, the, they were Episcopal. The Episcopalians are an extension of the Church of England. And they had no problem. They had really no problem with having these Freemasons. Cornelius Harnett, given a Masonic burial at St. James Episcopal Church. He lays there today. We know that there was a Cameron Duncan, and he was laid to rest somewhere around 4th Street in Wilmington. We don't know exactly where because they dug up his body and moved it to Oakdale Cemetery, but we have one of the oldest Masonic headstones in Wilmington for Mr. Cameron Duncan, a native of Scotland. And he was given an Episcopal burial from all we can tell by that, that headstone. And he was a Freemason, very prominently displayed on his headstone. It has the square and compasses, a blazing sun in the middle. The square and compasses are set to the fellow craft. Blazing sun in the middle, and over the top of it it says, Siat lux et lux fuit. And then on the back it talks about what a good man he was. And yet, James Ald, the, the Methodist preacher in the West, has to say, I buried Mr. J.B., a horrible sinner and Freemason. Now, a lot of the lodges out in the West, they have some pretty interesting connections as well to American history. In fact, there's a man who's born, we're not sure if it was in Tennessee or in North Carolina, but in North Carolina we love to claim him. And that would be Andrew Jackson. His mother actually tended to the wounds of a Mr. James Stokes, who was a prominent Freemason who had traveled from New Bern into the backcountry during the Revolutionary War. She tends to his wounds. Possibly, he's introduced to Freemasonry either in Tennessee or in North Carolina. Now, Andrew Jackson, quite an amazing man. Did you know he was a Freemason? He is a Freemason. We're not sure where he was made a Freemason. However, to give you an idea of his personality, He's responsible for the Trail of Tears, which is a bad thing. But he is also very much responsible for setting America into a very populist type of politics. Uh, when he was elected president, more people elected him president than any person before. And he said, because of that, I therefore have free reign to do what I should do and what I want as president. To the victor belongs the spoils. And his further actions as a president, some people began to think that he was acting like a king. Well, because he was a Freemason, it's because of his first term as a president that the anti-Masonic party begins to get steam. Now, that anti-Masonic party, it actually gets a really good push with a little affair that we call the Morgan Affair. Uh, uh, have you heard of the Morgan Affair? Okay. I, I hope everybody in here is aware that there was the James Morgan um, arrested and then some Freemasons paid his bail and we don't know what happened to him afterwards. Now, we do know that a body washes up in Canada and it's not James Morgan, but one Morgan's as good as another and therefore everybody latches on and says, there he is, he's dead. And the Freemasons did it. And with Andrew Jackson being a Freemason... This pushed the anti-Masonic party to prominence. But Andrew Jackson was introduced to Freemasonry possibly here in North Carolina. Because we know that Stokes was a Freemason and his mother tended to Stokes' wounds. Now, also, during the Revolutionary War, one thing we can say, though we don't know much about the lodges that were popping up in the West, they are beginning to correspond with the lodges in the East, which is wonderful for if you are Francis Marion. 
Francis Marion, perhaps you've heard of him as the Swamp Fox. He had a militia and he would hide in the green swamp. Now they would always find out where Cornwallis was moving to next. I wonder how he got the information. Possibly being passed around in the lodges and then passed to him and he would bring his militia in, skirmish with Cornwallis and then disappear back into the swamps. Every time that Cornwallis thought he had him, the swamp fox, Francis Marion, would move away again and disappear. We think that the correspondences were happening from members of the lodges because lodges have a very good system of correspondence. We still do today. It only makes sense for them to have used it during the Revolutionary War. And in the West, they certainly were. That interconnectedness of, of Freemasonry in this time was very integral for the Revolutionary War. Now, in the West, also, some lodges would confer a first degree. And then in 1787, we have a Grand Lodge of North Carolina. Now, in the West, how, do you, how many of you have um, heard in Lodge, maybe not said, but you've heard in Lodge how the Grand Lodge is them, and then there's we don't want to do it that way. <laughs> have you guys heard that? Yeah, it, we hear it everywhere. But in the West, it, it's very prominent. And there is a tradition behind it. In 1787, the Grand Lodge of North Carolina and Tennessee forms. And that Grand Lodge of, of North Carolina would confer higher degrees. So you could have somebody pass to fellow craft and then made a Master Mason from the Grand Lodge of North Carolina. Now, where does this animosity actually begin? Well, whose right is it to confer the third degree? Shouldn't that be your home lodge? Have you noticed that we can, we can farm out first and second degrees, but third degrees we try to keep at home more than any other? It comes from that tradition, well, or that retaliation, I should say, from when the Grand Lodge first formed in 1787 and started handing out the higher degrees. The lodges were very upset by this and especially in the West. Because who was running the Grand Lodge of England, or the Grand Lodge of North Carolina at that time? Guys from the East. There was always that divide. And that's something that's always, always important to remember, especially as we look at how lodges move in North Carolina. Now, the lodges in the West, they do begin to congeal. And with the advent of trains and good roads, finally, they begin to blossom because now people can truly move through the states. And it seems that as the roads and as transportation got better, that obviously behind it follows along commerce and more people from the East moving into the West. We know that many people from the East moved into the West. Uh, William Richardson Davy, uh, Caswell, it looks like even Cornelius Harnett a couple of times, to, as the roads improved. And with them, they brought their money, but they also come back and say at one point in 1790, I believe, that they said that the lodge in Salisbury was the intellectual equal, if not superior, of all other lodges in the state. The intellectual equal, if not superior, to all the other lodges in the state. And it's amazing, as we begin to see the lodges chartered through the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, that all of a sudden we begin to have their records. But 
the West, the, the history, the tradition of the West is far more nebulous than anything we have from, from the East. Now, as we're pushing west into North Carolina, I'm actually going to expand out of North Carolina a little bit because it gets so nebulous in the west. Now, as it moved into Tennessee, and Freemasonry moves with people into Tennessee, and Tennessee soon becomes its own state. Today, if you go to Oregon or Montana or Nebraska. Has anyone been to a lodge in those places? I know the Grand Lodge of Oregon in Nebraska, they have histories written and their histories are very interesting because they start talk, you would expect them to start talking about how it formed in their state, right? It starts with a little lodge on the coast of the Cape Fear in 1735, becoming Solomon Lodge, which then there was a schism that led to St. John's Lodge. And then Cornelius Harnett from St. John's Lodge began distributing his, under his authority, charters for other lodges throughout North Carolina. And as they moved, these traditions looked back to North Carolina as the beginning of their Masonic tradition. What this actually means is that when we talk about North Carolina Freemasonry, we're not talking about just North Carolina. We are talking about a branch of Freemasonry, a set of traditions that we have and that we still practice every day here that have influenced the United States as a whole, all the way into the West. If you think about it, to have Oregon citing the first lodge in its tradition being Solomon Lodge in North Carolina, that says a lot for what we do. Now, when we think about the purpose of what we do as Freemasons in North Carolina. Let's take a look, just kind of rehash what we've learned today since everyone's in here. We know that we are part of the oldest or one of the oldest fraternal organizations in the Western Hemisphere. That our oldest lodge existed since before the United States was created and was integral in leading revolts against the Stamp Act as well as, propon as a, a great proponent for the idea of independence and not reconciliation to the British crown. Therefore, we can say that North Carolina Masons and in turn, North Carolina Freemasonry played an integral role in the idea of being an independent and free United States. That tradition also extends on our push going to the Pacific all the way through Tennessee and pushing out into the frontier, which is extremely important for us as Freemasons of North Carolina to keep in mind. We are not always certain of what our purpose has been or what our legacy should be. But when we look back into the history of what we have done and what we mean for Freemasonry in America, I hope everyone in here sits and is very proud to be a North Carolina Mason. At that point, I will hand it over to you or take any questions. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, we'll do some questions. You still got um, 15, 25 minutes. Oh, I do. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize. 11, 11, 15. Oh, I did not realize that. Okay, okay, <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll field questions and, and I'll go on. Yes? Uh, Solomon Lodge. Now, we know Brother Oberford has Solomon Lodge in Savannah. Yes. Okay, it's still in existence. It is. Does that charter, does anything exist anywhere whatsoever about the Solomon Lodge in North Carolina? Uh, what does exist, uh, what we have, is the notes from uh, Thomas Tinneth saying that he brought a charter with him, and there is an entry in the, in the books 
in, in the Grand Lodge, United Grand Lodge now, of England, where Solomon Lodge was chartered the same day as the charter in um, Savannah, Georgia. Excuse me, I've already said South Carolina before, Savannah, Georgia. That Solomon Lodge was chartered the same day, oh, but the one in the Cape Fear is the one entered in the books, and then they make a later correction and say, oh, it should have been both. So we do know that there is that much still in existence. We don't have any records aside from that. We have no charter. We have no minutes. Um, the minutes probably were at St. John's and probably taken by Cornwallis in 1781. If there were minutes. That's if the lodge itself completely changed its name. Otherwise, the minutes were never held at St. John's and they were at Solomon if it was running concurrently and they're completely lost. We have no idea where they are. Any idea where they were met? Yes, there's a little road in Wilmington. Uh, it's called Masonboro Loop Road. And Masonboro, yeah, Masonboro. We think that they were meeting along that road. Uh, we do know that William Hooper's house, is the foundation is still there and they've built a beautiful large house on top of it. It's uh, called Finian. That was the name of his, his Oceanside Plantation, Finian. And we do know that St. John's met at Finian. And if he was a member of Solomon and St. John's, it would not be that far of a stretch to think that Solomon met on his property as well. But we think it met in Masonboro, and we think it met somewhere along Masonboro Loop Road. There are some people that say that they remember an old house that had Masonic markings scratched all over it. Which brings me to a point on the West, actually. Um, and that house in 1913, I believe, burnt down. Uh, but people that lived in the house always said that they remembered that in the basement there were Masonic markings and other strange ciphers on the walls, whatever that might have meant. Now, it's funny, um, as we're talking about Freemasonry, if we go to the West, uh, there's a guy named Squire Boone, who was Daniel Boone's dad. He has his, his grave in North Carolina. And if you ever see Squire Boone's grave, there is a circumpunct on the grave. It's a very rudely shaped, it's all rudely done. It's not the prettiest stone. But there is a circumpunct. And if you look closely, it looks like it might even have two lines, which would be the symbol of dedication to the Holy Saints John. So that might mean that Squire Boone was a Freemason there's some good, um, some good uh, evidence for that on his grave. So we know that even then, Freemasonry was in the western part of the state. There's also a house uh, that on the western facade of the house, it is covered with engravings, Masonic engravings. Um, I'll look really quickly and see if I can find a picture. Which one? Yes, the Hezekiah Alexander House. Thank you, I couldn't remember the name. But yeah, that house, has, the western facade is covered. And that also is proof that Freemasonry was a very alive and vibrant in the West. So we've got, we've got proof that there was Freemasonry from way back um, in all parts of the state. It's just we don't have the documented charter or the minutes. I wish we did, so I could once and for all prove that, that Solomon Lodge did exist, and it's not just a legend. But that'd be wonderful if I could prove it. Any other questions? None. Oh. Um, <laughs> I know I'm a little short. I'm, I have this uh, question. Yeah. Uh, the lodges that are out west that have their roots in North Carolina, Mm-hmm. Were those Masons that moved away from North Carolina that formed those lodges? Yes, yes. Uh, the Mason, as a lodge is formed, you know, you have to have a certain number of Freemasons actually able to meet in one place and then they apply for dispensation. Um, many of these 
Masons that started in North Carolina, as they saw the expansion pushing west. Remember, this wasn't the richest area in the colonies. Uh, even, even for the rich people, uh, they were paling in comparison to the, the very, very rich of New York and Boston and Philadelphia. But they were still extremely rich. The Moors, King Roger Moore, who really kind of founds the state in 1729, 1724, 1729 in that area, he's old money. He's a friend of the king. But he too came from up north and dropped south so that he could open plantations. He didn't plan to stay. He planned to use the land and go back home. But then he built a beautiful house and ended up staying and built a town and he stayed to try to make it work. Uh, many of these people were migrating. So the rich are definitely migrating and migrating west and pushing out even further, especially with the Transatlantic Railroad. That was a huge push for Freemasonry as well. So they weren't fleeing out of, for political reasons, they were doing it out of opportunity. They were doing it out of opportunity, mostly. Uh, political reasons in North Carolina, the only people that are really fleeing political reasons are the Scots. Uh, right. they're, yeah, they, they, are, they are being pushed out by the English. Uh, the Battle of Alamance, for example, is a clear-cut example of the hatred of, between the English and the Scots. The Battle of Moore's Creek is like Battle of Alamance Part Two, and another moment of that clear hatred. If you were a loyalist, though, um, you had to give up your guns, you had to give up your property it, whenever the patriots would take your area. Um, some people, very few, would actually run from it. What most people did even though we hear the stories of people running. That's actually very few and far between. Most people would show up and take the oath and say, yes, I swear to be a good patriot and remain as a patriot until the patriots left. Then the loyalists would come in, they'd walk up, I swear to be a good loyalist. Uh, it, it, that way they would keep their property. And that was what actually happened mostly through the revolution and even in the Civil War very often. If the Confederates moved in and took a... a a Union scalawag town, you know, that supported the Union, the people would turn out and they wouldn't say, oh, we support the Union. They might at first, but pretty soon, okay, we support the Confederates, have a, you know, live peacefully, and then the Confederates would move on and the Union would drop in and we support you guys. It, that's what a lot of people do. You can even see it with ISIS, for example. Um, many of these groups are, do not believe in that medieval version of, um, I, want to, I want to say, Umayyad, caliphate type Islam. But they'll profess their, their, their adherence to it while ISIS holds the town you know, it, it, for safety. It, many people run, it but. In many wars. Yeah, that's exactly what happens in many wars. When in Rome, and when Rome comes to you, yes, it, and that's what usually happened. But most people are actually pushing west out of, um, out of opportunity. For example, uh, there's a guy from Ohio named George Brinton McClellan. Uh, he's, he, he, yes, the, please give me back my army, Mr. McClellan, yes. Uh, he, he, he was a Mason. He was a very good Mason. Uh, but how he became a free... What's that? He had crazy dreams. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he had crazy dreams. Yeah, let's be but, fair, he was just miscast. He was a great recruiter. He was a great quartermaster. He had a great army, but he didn't want to fight any battles. He did. He wanted to dig. Actually, what he wanted to do was dig, flank, and turn. Every single time, which for the technology of the time was exactly correct. However, it takes a long time to do that. And when the other army is coming at you in lines, Lincoln correctly wanted his army back. Uh, <laughs> for the you know, the, the mismatch of tactics and understanding, plus calling Lincoln a baboon probably didn't go over very well. But for example, McClellan, to, to kind of push this idea, He's from Ohio, and he becomes, uh, he goes to West Point, graduates uh, very high in his class, 
and he's a great engineer, and he's pulled on by the Ohio Railroads, the B&O Railroad, in fact, all the way to after the war, in fact, he's also the head of that railroad. But before, he is one of the chief engineers. So he is not making bad money. He's making great money with what he's doing. From Ohio, with aspirations in New Jersey, but he followed his railroad to Oregon, which is where he got all three degrees in one day. So... And that was in 1853. He got all three degrees in one day. And then he goes back and he becomes governor of Jersey. Um, he's heading the B&O Railroad. He's doing lots of great things after the Civil War, but you can see that opportunity with him going to Oregon to get the degrees. So yeah, most people are pushing west uh, in Nebraska, Montana, Oregon, places that also claim from us their tradition. They were going there and creating lodges because of opportunities in those areas. So then the follow-up question would be, if they are getting charters from Solomon Lodge... Well, St. John's, John's, yeah. Uh, is there some way we can get a historical connection on the dates on how long our lodge existed? Ooh. There's got to be a way to do that. Um, St. John's records start in 1788. All the ones uh, that we had previous to that were gone in 1781 when Cornwallis came through. Uh, in fact, the very first day in 1788, we have Richard Caswell as, a, as an interim master to start off the lodge again in under dispensation. So we're a UD lodge in 1788. So we, we were under dispensation twice at least. So those records are gone. But if you look at the charters for Royal White Hart, that's got Cornelius Harnett's signature. Um, there's a few out there that have Cornelius Harnett's signature on their charters. And I wouldn't be surprised if you look at some of the Tennessee charters if they might not be handed out by Montfort and Cornelius Harnett. We know that they opened six lodges in five years when Montfort was, was the Grand Master of North America. So, you know, at one point, there's a rush in five years. So I wouldn't be surprised if there was even more that we don't know about. And some records of correspondence. Some, really yes, records of correspondence would definitely help. Um, really, if we could reach back to the Grand Lodge of England, because they might have also some of that um, correspondence. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you so much for yeah. doing it. I, I, sorry that I fell a little.